I'm afraid I do not have uh, printed copies for you today. If you would like um, copies of the slides, they're available through the link um, there, which will take you to my blog. Um, and within the next day, there will also be a uh, video of this talk there for you with captions for you to see. Um, so after the fact, you should get some stuff. Uh, my talk today is called <laughs> Cultivating Disability Prehistories When Student Bodies Entered General Education. Uh, this is coming out of my dissertation research, which was looking at the City University of New York system, very old system comprising over 20 campuses in New York City. Um, what I was trying to figure out using the extensive archives of the CUNY system uh, was what's the oldest disability service program I could find? Uh, I found some rumors in histories that CUNY had a really old program, one of only a few others, um, one in Kentucky and one in uh, Michigan as the other two really old programs. Um, and what I found was, this was easy research, went back to 1946, turned it out, turned out it was a program based on uh, veterans rehabilitation um, and it was designed specifically to focus on rehabilitating the body of students so that they could fit in physically onto campus. That was the, the mentality of the program developed by, there's an image here of a um, academic article in the journal Rehabilitation Literature um, called The Facilitation uh, of the Education of the Physically Disabled College Student by Margaret E. Condon. Uh, she's the one who developed the program at City College and really popularized her model of disability services around the nation. And it looked a lot like disability services as we know it. Um, it had, uh, it was overseen by what was called the Health Guidance Board, which was made up of medical doctors and staff from the institution. Um, it provided accommodations like uh, paid readers for the blind. This was before, of course, books on tape were a thing, really, um, though they invested in them. And this board was responsible for a lot of investment in disability infrastructure. Uh, they also, as I was reading through their documents, had a really weird little thing coming through and hinting that more research needed to happen. Um, they described among all of their charges, including providing accommodations, um, that they sought to effect m adjustment to the maximum correction of physical defects. That was part of their mission in disability service, was to correct the body and its defects. This stuck out to me as interesting. Um, as I dug a bit more into the program, I found some other really interesting cultural quirks feeding in. Um, this is an article from the Alumni Magazine in 1957 um, titled, City College's Sturdy Sons, a veteran physical education professor tells the inspiring story of an, an, of an unusual group of students. Um, and what it's describing is a special, uh, a special course um, in physical education for students with disabilities who were flagged through this system that existed, and they had to take PE classes designed to remediate their disabilities. Um, they would have their records uh, given to any professor who asked for them to see how their remediation is doing. Uh, in the system. So there's this whole paternalistic system built around it. But in terms of the public picture, it's all about student success through academic fit or academic ability and physical fitness, especially the college's sturdy sons. They, every time they talk about disabled students in the public press or in the alumni magazines of this period, they talk about them as rugged. They talk about them as, as culturally integrated. They talk about them as fitting in to, to the campus. Uh, and there's a really clear discourse that's coming through. So as I said, this was all sort of the easy stuff was simply finding what I'm calling the birth of disability at City College. This was the moment that the institution first built an apparatus specifically designed for managing students with disabilities, 1946. But already I'm seeing hints of something else under there and I wanted to figure out what that was. So that's where I'm going for the rest of this talk and to take you a little farther back into what I'm calling the prehistory of disability at City College. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about student bodies and how students started to get bodies and what happened before that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the expanding of academic ability into academic physical ability as a, as a category. Um, and then I want to track through just a few little aftershocks that I see leading up to the present day. So this isn't all early history, but it, I'll bring it back to the present. So. Where I, where I want to go first is just a quick jump into the literature. Um, there is a great book um, by Heather Monroe Prescott called Student Bodies, the Influence of Student Health Services in American Society and Medicine. Um, one of the hard parts about studying the history of disability, um, 
is that the, cat, the names that we use to describe things change over time. Um, so even going to an archive at your local institution and looking up the word disability will only take you back a few decades. You might have to use a word like handicapped to go farther than that. Or um, you might have to look at the medical side of things. Um, in this case, this uh, book is tracking through how universities came to provide health care to students, which was a, a really strange thing at the time that had a lot of arguing for, and was really closely linked to the fact that medicine was rising as a professional discipline. Doctors were trying to become this equal to lawyers or judges in society at the, at the turn of the 19th century. And one of the ways that they did that was by establishing themselves on campuses where they could take on a role as researcher, but also as a uh, caretaker for students and really have that, that area to themselves. So this change happened right at the height of the social hygiene movement. Um, social hygiene movement was an American movement primarily concerned with improving the stock of the United States. And when they say the stock, they mean the racial stock of the white middle class United States. Just to be clear, that's what they mean. Um, so the programs that, that are really uh, emblematic of the social hygiene movement, we're talking about things dealing with health and physical wellness, um, getting people aware of exercise as a thing that's important, or nutrition was a big, a big education campaign so they did. Um, public health and safety, um, they're fighting things like tuberculosis, like polio, communicable disease was a big deal, and VD was a big deal. Um, there was lots of po positive eugenics in here, which is a euphemism for a eugenics that's not about sterilizing or keeping people from breeding, but improving the breedability and breeding stock of the ones you want to keep. Um, so in this case, it was about teaching sex education, teaching uh, men, especially men in the military, not to contract uh, syphilis. It was a social campaign. Anyway, um, so there's a guy named Thomas A. Story who was one of the founding members of the social hygiene movement. He was the editor of the Social Hygiene Journal. He was uh, prominent working in the departments of health and uh, doing campaigns for uh, anti-VD especially. Um, he got tasked with coming up with programs for college health programs. So he came to work at City College and he developed his first program, which he then used as a model around the nation. Here is a quote from that Prescott book. Uh, story concluded that college hygiene programs not only improved the health of the individual student, but also helped, quote, sell hygiene to the larger society by convincing future leaders to adopt the most up-to-date laws of public health and personal hygiene. So getting college students was seen as a way of getting at the rest of the population. Despite the fact that it's a small percentage, the idea was college students obviously are gonna rise to the top of society. So if they are used to going to doctors, everybody will follow after. It's a very paternalistic view, but the college students get to be the next fathers of the generation. Um, so this is Thomas Story. Uh, here he is at City College. There's a, in this image, uh, this is a photograph. Okay, I'll back up. Um, I found a, in 1913, Story had been at City College for three years. Um, he advertised his program widely. He wrote a lot about the role of the gymnasium at colleges the curriculum that should go into health and hygiene programs. Um, and he published a 50-page booklet that advertises the structure of the gymnasium. It lays out floor plans. It goes through all of the infrastructure, lays out the curriculum, justifies the curriculum. It's really a picture of his brain at the time that he was designing this program. So this image shows a story, I believe, pretty sure. Um, or it's either that or his colleague who followed directly after. Um, the caption reads, examination for evidence upon which to base individual instruction in personal hygiene. Um, he's using a stethoscope uh, to presumably check the lungs of somebody. Uh, a young student, shirtless, is facing away from the camera. Uh, story is facing away from the camera. And there's a, there's a secretary sitting next to him taking notes. Those notes stay in the student's file until the student graduates out of the health program. This is a new institutional space, by the way. They're show this is a college campus that they're showing with white tile and hospital, hospital decor. So this is the great expansion of student physical ability is happening at City College 
right at this moment. The institution is investing in a gymnasium and a curriculum to go with it, and it's buying in fully. Um, we're in 1913 here. Uh, so in this time, there was instituted a four course hygiene requirement for all students to graduate. Um, they'd learn about causes of communicable diseases, physical cleanliness, sexual moral health. Um, there was a heavy swimming requirement. The university was very proud of its swimming pool, which was a big deal in an age of very easy communicable disease at public swimming pool. They were very proud of the cleanliness, the almost godly cleanliness of their pool, which we'll, we'll see. Um, Students took lectures, they had to learn exercises, um, they had to go through physical inspections, um, and there was a junior exam. So this was, this was enforced through literacy, is one of the, the things about it. There were exams given in the gymnasium itself. Um, there was a lot of writing produced to get students through this curriculum. Um, eventually, there will be a whole chapter about the curriculum. Uh, Pictured is a view of the main gymnasium floor from above. The caption reads, uh, floor talk on hygiene. Um, so over here is the instructor in a white coat, white lab coat. Um, these are all the students are laid out in rows along the floor. The rows match the rows built into the environment. Throughout these images, we keep seeing the environment and the students being aligned with each other. We're meant to notice that the students are influenced by the environment. They become this orderly environment. Uh, there are, as well, other assistants in white around the sides who I don't know who they are. I think they might be teaching assistants something, or they work for the medical facilities. I don't know. So on the one hand, these documents are talking about an academic investment. Um, the gym is a futuristic space for students to work in. Imagine the things students can do with their, uh, their academic abilities within the gym. In this photo, it reads, layout of apparatus in the main exercising hall. Um, it's the same hall as before, very spacious, but now there's pummel horses and parallel bars and things like that. Again, these are the kinds of exercises they were learning. Um, and students had to be able to demonstrate proficiency on in order to graduate. Um, the curriculum becomes an extension of the gymnasium. So the college invests their money in a gym, the curriculum comes with it, and the enforcement of that curriculum and the general education requirements come after that. And what we start to see, as I said, is the students become an extension of the gymnasium. This is my, my favorite picture from this um, that I have to write a whole, whole book about. Um, it's called Isle of Showers in the Swimming Pool Room. Again, they were very proud of the pool. Um, it shows a line of nude men back facing um, going off into the distance. They're showing off the fact that 100 men could take a shower at the same time in these facilities. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> back to Prescott. By the late 1920s, more than 300 colleges and universities offered courses that covered eugenic themes, with as many as 20,000 students enrolled. Story was a big part of this. He spread his curriculum wide. He wrote about it publicly. He went on to um, higher public office and advertised his beliefs um, for school children, actually. Um, he, he worked in grade schools next. I want to, in the last minute I have for you, I want to track through some aftershocks. So we've been back in time quite a ways. I want to carry us forward. And this is very easy research to do. You don't need to have a lurid past at your institution to, to dig this up. But these are just quotations from the admissions section of the City College Bulletin at a few different years. Think about what year it is after I say it and see if that makes sense to you. This is from the subsection in admissions, physically handicapped students. All admissions are subject to the provision that the candidate meets the health standards of the college. Severely handicapped students will have their applications reviewed by the Health Guidance Board to determine whether they could profit from college training. Subsection changes in, or this is two years previous. Health services and medical regulations. Students with remedial, physical, or health defects are required to report with evidence that the situation has the attention of the parents, guardian, or family medical advisor. Failure to respond as directed may result in, in debarment from classes. 
And Story writes privately about having actually de debarred students in their final year because they don't pass the requirements or because they don't comply by having a family doctor. So this was really done. That was 1968 and 69. Uh, from 1977 to 79, this is, by the way, after the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 had become into force. So there's a problem here that you'll notice. A health statement from the student's personal physician must be fi filed by each accepted student. The ellipses just remove the, the type of form that you have to do. I didn't figure you need to know that. Uh, the college reserves the right to reject an applicant because of an existing health condition. Uh, they realize, this is ent entirely my interpretation. Um, you'll notice that the statement below is precisely the same, except for one sentence has been added to the end. Um, after uh, the college reserves the right to reject an applicant because of an existing health condition, they added the college does not discriminate against handicapped students. Uh, my favorite thing about this, by the way, is that college in that last sentence is lowercase, the only place in the entire document it is which suggests to me that they put it in in the very last second because they forgot that they aren't supposed to discriminate against disabled folks. Because by this time, of course, it was illegal to do so. So I, I bring this as the last example because I'm really interested in these transitional moments when the definition of disability is changing or the definition of ability is changing. What I discovered in looking back into the history None of the Thomas Story eugenics stuff ever talks about disability. Never ever. They aren't concerned with disability. They're concerned with ability. And they're concerned with defining a new kind of student ability that they want to center in the curriculum. That's significant. That left a legacy that carried on into the 40s and carried on into the 60s and carried on into the 80s of paternalistic monitoring of students' medical uh, status, of attention to student body as a uh, prerequisite for entry into the space. These things have a long history that continues with us. And I think by looking forward, uh, or rather, as we look forward, what we need to think is, where do our expansions of student ability leave room for disability to be created? Disablement was created in that gymnasium. That wasn't the in intention, but it was. What are our gymnasiums? Are they writing centers? Are they learning management systems? That's what we want us to think about going forward. Thank you for listening.